I grew up in southwest Iowa, rolling farm hills, contours, challenging organic conditions, I guess. Uh, Dad first certified around year 2000, and we've been organic seed dealers since then, so we talk to a lot of different organic farmers, see a lot of different organic methods, and successes and failures of each, I guess. Um, I'd like to ask, I guess, who in this room has been organic for, say, five years or longer? I know there's some experts in here. Okay. How about five years or less? A few. And how about people just thinking about starting transitioning? Okay, quite a few of them. Good. Glad to see there's some beginners in here. Um, for, for you beginners, I guess, I'm going to ask, what do you feel your main challenges going into organic or just organic in general? What would be your number one challenge you think coming or potential problem that you think you're going to face? Anybody have any ideas? Risk, yep, yep. Any weed control, fertility, yep, that's a big one. Soil loss. Soil loss, yep, another great big one. That's kind of a list of some things that you know we I typically see a lot of. Um, you know, weeds is probably the number one thing that people get scared of. You drive by an organic farm, it's nothing but weeds. You get scared. Everybody is embarrassed of weeds. It's ugly. You know, it looks bad. Fertility is another big thing. Where am I going to do without anhydrous? What can, you know, that's just a, what do you do? What do you do? You know, seed genetics is another one. Well, you can't use GMO seed, obviously. So, you know, some people are just baffled by non-roundup crops. They don't realize that there is such a thing. You get questions. It's crazy. Um, equipment, you know, that's the other thing. You know, the, you know, cultivating is a lost art. Rotary hoeing. You know, my dad, grandpa did it. People are just baffled by it. If they can't take 120 foot in a sprayer, what they just don't know what to do. Time, another thing, it takes time. You're out in your field instead of, in our area at least, most farmers maybe cross their fields two to maybe three times. They plant it, typically hire the co-op to spray it, and they combine it. Where we're crossing those same acres four, five, six plus times a year. Takes a lot of time. And yields, you know, people are concerned if I do switch to organic, am I going to have 100 bushel corn and 10 bushel beans? And all, you know, good, good, very good points, very good challenges. But I intentionally left off the number one challenge. And I want to ask if anybody can think of that. And if one of the older guys or more experienced guys have that, feel free to jump ahead. I know Doug probably can, the last few years have been especially weather there you go number one challenge is weather and I put this picture the two comparison between the two bean fields that is the same exact treatments same everything was the same there other than we planted tried to beat the rain here planting ahead of it it rained for two and a half weeks we couldn't do anything it was dry for two weeks after we planted that field the cultivation was the same the hoeing was the same everything was the same that kind of turned into a disaster that was probably the cleanest beans I'll ever raise in my life and the only thing difference there was the weather. So that can just, that is the number one challenge, I guess. So basically what I'm going to talk about today is just my system. It's not right. It's not, I'm by no means an expert. Just ask my neighbors. Um, we, have a, we have successes and we have failures, but I like to think that we're getting better over time, I guess. So I'm just going to talk about my system. Scott's, I think, going to talk about his system and run through a few numbers and comparison of organic to conventional. And I guess if you guys see a slide that you have a specific question about while I'm talking, don't be afraid to jump in. I'll quickly answer it. But if we get too far off subject, I may ask that we wait till we get done at the end. So, Our system, I guess, we start clean. Um, we try to tell everything fairly black within reason, but get rid of at least all the big weeds before you start because if you're starting with you know six inch weeds you're going to have nothing but trouble um, we typically delay planting you want to plant into a warm dry forecast like i showed on that soybean slide the typical conventional wisdom is to hurry and plant before rains oh my gosh it's going to rain this weekend i've got to plant this week and get it done well with what we've f figured out is you're kind of the opposite of that you want to really if you can plant into a warm dry forecast. We typically will rotary hoe one or two times, cultivate as soon as possible. We do ridge till some of our soybeans, which is a whole different topic for a whole nother day. And then we do walk for our problem weeds. Um, 
I, we kind of emphasize keeping clean fields clean. Um, we emphasize weed control probably harder on our clean fields or clean farms than the dirty ones just to keep that weed seed bank down. And if you can keep them clean, start clean, keep them clean, you'll have a lot, a lot better long-term success versus if you focus on the weedy ones and then let the clean ones go, then pretty soon everything's weedy, if that makes sense. So. Um, this is a couple of pictures of tearing up our cover crops or alfalfa. Um, we've recently purchased a John Deere 550 Mulch Master, which if you're not familiar with it, it's got 24-inch um, sweeps on it, great big aggressive sweeps, and then two rows of spader wheels on the back that kind of separate the soil out of the roots. And is probably, I guess as far as my experience, the best thing for tearing up um, alfalfa or cover crops because you work that top two or three inches shallow and then those spader wheels get the dirt out of the roots and get r real effective kills. Other method we've used, a chisel plow with sweeps is probably the most common one today. Um, basically any old chisel plow, you can put 18 or 20 inch sweeps on it or heel sweeps, which uses a combination of a sweep and the point and gets that undergrowth cut um, without doing a complete inversion like a moldboard plow does. And then some people can get by just disking. Um, with newer, heavier discs and you know, some of the more modern ones, it is possible just to go out and you know, disc it a couple times and get away with that fine. Um, planting, we, like I said, mentioned, we kind of delay our planting. Ideally in our area in southwest Iowa, I guess, May 10th to May 20th is ideal. Um, my observation has been that we'll, weeds will cause more yield loss than late planting. Um, I guess it's pretty, I guess we, I don't feel that we lose all that much yield planting in that May 20, 10 to 20th range versus if you, it takes the corn three weeks to come up, you're going to be in trouble from the start. You want a warm, dry forecast. Increasing populations, that's kind of a debate. Um, we, I would recommend, and being a seed dealer, I guess we recommend maybe 10% over a conventional. If you're normally, say, planting 30,000, I'd maybe up it to 32, 33,000. Just because as you're rotary hoeing, you're going to have some stand loss and you're going to bury some with a cultivator. But I will say that is sometimes debatable because if you're in a lower fertility situation, sometimes actually backing it down can be more productive too. But that's open to, I guess, your own discussion and um, your own fields and you know your own situation. We do run trash whippers on our planter, which I think are important. Um, everybody says you're tilling everything. Why do you need trash whippers? Well, what they do is we a lot of times will have some clods or root balls from the alfalfa or orchard grass, and we run them up as far as high up as they will go, and we actually drilled a couple new holes to get them even higher so that if you just – it just kind of rolls a few clods out of the way, makes it a more even seed bed. If you do run into that trouble where you dissed it too wet or something, you can set those trash whippers down, roll some of those clods out of the way, and get a good seed bed. And then just recently, Dr. Joel Groover at Western Illinois has started doing some trials, and he has had some pretty significant data that he doesn't quite understand yet. But running the aggressive row, row cleaners fairly aggressively has been showing like a 60-70% um, weed loss. And I think it's kind of similar to the ridge till where you're moving some of those top um, seeds out of that top layer of soil and giving that you know a, a exposed area so and the main thing i guess is just be patient um, it's hard when you're everybody your neighbors are asking why aren't you planting why aren't you planting but you really want to wait for a warm dry forecast yep because yep the uh, question was why do we want to wait and plant into a warm dry forecast um, that most typically they want to plant before rain to get your crops coming up because when that rains you're, you're basically everything you're giving the weeds a chance to start growing where when we're tilling right before we plant usually we're drying out that top inch or inch and a half of the soil and therefore your the weeds are behind the seeds the seeds we plant deeper into moisture so the seeds can the crop can start growing hopefully before you get a rain where then the weeds start growing as well Correct. Yep. 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 We're starting clean with hopefully everything dead when we start planting the seeds into the moisture 
and then hopefully those seeds will grow from the deeper salt moist soil and get a head start before the rains start everything in the top inch of the soil or yep yep Yep. Doug's comment was that you want to be in there on, say, day three to five is what our goal is with some form of a harrow, a hoe or something um, to get that very first flood or flush of weeds. Or if it rains right after you plant and rains for a week behind, you can't do anything. Then everything's coming at the same time at the same speed. And that was what happened with that weedy soybeans. It rained for two and a half weeks right after we planted it. We couldn't do anything. And then by that point, it was just solid green like a carpet. Weeds and soybeans. Yep, they. Yep, I'll get to that as we. Yep, as we'll do. That's. That's the. It, that okay? Question was: What running these disc or the row cleaners making a furrow? How do you keep from pushing that soil back in when you cultivate or hoe? I actually want to be able to do that. I want to be able to push that soil back in around the, because that will bury the weeds that are right next to the row. And I'll get to that kind of going forward here too. Rotary hoeing, I typically say if you can row it, hoe it. Um, be, but at the same point, be careful not to bury tiny plants. Um, I've had lots of seed customers that get told, rotary hoeing, put the tractor in seventh or eighth gear wide open. If you aren't bouncing your head off the ceiling, go faster. And I kind of disagree with that because you can make a mess of things. If you're going into real tiny corn, which this is just basically two leaf corn, there's times where I maybe are only going five mile an hour, just enough to rough up that crusted soil or that, that top, very top inch or so. And then you want to use a well-maintained rotary hoe. Um, that's the other problem we run into is a lot of this equipment hasn't been made for 30 years. And a lot of it's been sitting in the fence row under the trees rusty locked up and rotary hose especially every one of them wheels has its own bearing if they've been sitting outside they're going to turn hard or they're going to fall off and you're going to find them later um, the arms each one of those wheels too has an arm that needs to move move freely if it's all locked up you can make a mess in a hurry and i don't know if any of you experienced guys have tried changing rotary hoe bearings it's <laughs> it's not fun and if anybody has a good way to do it tell me <laughs> because we've recently just went to buying new wheels because it's not worth the time and aggravation of trying to ch change those bearings. Correct, yep, it's just a, yep, yep. This is just a couple more pictures of rotary hoeing. Um, like you see there, we've got kind of, this This was a, actually a perfect year of rotary hoeing. Um, this was day eight, the corn's already emerging at two leaf. Um, it hadn't, I think we maybe had one like quarter inch rain between this. So there was just a real light kind of crust on that first half inch or so. That rotary hoe just did an absolutely beautiful job of breaking up that top, very top half inch and then drying that soil out, which in turn kills those first flush of weeds. Does rotary hoeing help? That's a picture where I couldn't fit another set of rows in next to my buffer. So I just left that and that was the edge where the rotary hoe had ran. And that would have been, I believe, three days after I rotary hoed, we took this picture, and it's pretty dramatic. Uh, a couple types of rotary hoes real quick. There's kind of two distinct different types. Um, the, the top or the left picture is the case 181 minimum till. The wheels are spaced real far apart. They don't overlap at all which is good for a lot of very high residue conditions. Um, we'll go through about anything pretty trouble free but they're harder to find and typically more expensive the john deere 400 is kind of the standard rotary hoe that's everywhere i guess wheels are very close together they overlap and they can plug and rip ball in corn stalks especially you can get rip balls or rocks that get jammed in them and if those two wheels get plugged and you start sliding them you make a mess pretty quick <laughs> Again, good wheels are, cr are crucial. The spoons need to be the size of a dime. That's the other problem when you use rotary hose is 90% of the ones you look are shot. If, that's, if that point is just a straight point, it basically you're gonna lose probably three fourths of your effectiveness. You really need that hoe wheel to have that spoon on the end of it. And like I said, roughly the size of a dime is what you want because you want good action. You want that soil to be flying 
turning behind you. Um, lots of action. Okay, I'm going to move on to cultivating. I run, if we run, we run Colovision mirrors. I don't think I could cultivate with a rear mount without one. Um, they're still actually made today, and I believe they're about two set, two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Which, if I was a beginning farmer starting out and didn't have much experience, that'd probably be the first thing I'd buy, because they basically just bolt right on the side of the tractor. You look down, can see exactly what's going on with your cultivator and which way you need to drive. Very, very, very helpful. We also do run a scout guidance system at some point. Um, I call it a poor man's GPS. They were made, what, in the 70s, I suppose? First one came out in 88. Okay, first one came out in 88, so I guess they're a little more newer than I thought, but still 30 years old. Uh, basic principle is you have a two sets of wands that rub along the edge of the crop and then correspond to uh, two hydraulic cylinders in the three-point hitch that swivel and then guide you through the through the crop they're very nice when they work they are very frustrating when they don't and they they they're simple in theory but not real easy to diagnose and adjust unless you really know what's going on um, there is companies now working on them and i believe they're rebuilding some of the older versions of them putting new new electronics and things on them and kind of making a comeback actually just going to talk a little bit of a couple different cultivators. My favorite is the Buffalo. You can basically do anything and everything with one if you have time to set it. Uh, basic principle is you have a cutting disc in the front, or the newer ones have it in the middle, but same principle. A residue cutting disc, stabilizing disc. There's two cutaway discs, which are kind of hard to see in this picture, that pull soil away or push it in. And then a, great, a single big wide sweep in the back. Um, to cut, undermine and cut weeds. This is day 21 cultivating with the buffalo. Um, you can see in this picture I've got those disc killers set. I believe in this picture they were about eight inches front to back, from the front, spaced apart, and pulling away from the row. And I was just going to draw a quick little picture about why I really like the buffalo system or a similar cultivator with cutaway discs. As you have your crop, plant corn crop or bean growing up, your corn plant is like, is growing, and my art skills are great, I know. And then your root system will be something similar to this. What you'll find as the weeds get bigger, this area between the two rows is fairly easy to cultivate with any type of cultivator. You can get, say, this area pretty easy to, pretty easy to wipe out. The weeds in here, what they will eventually start doing as they get bigger and get up into the crop canopy, is they're going to start leaning out. They're going to start reaching to this middle, wanting to get to sunlight. But with the buffalo style cultivator, you have that disc killer, which is round cutting in, and it sits at about a 30 degree angle to going forward, is pulling, pulling away. So as that weed start reaching for sunlight, that disc killer can grab that weed as it's leaning in and pull it out and it the good side of that is you can pull a lot of weeds out the bad side is it'll pull a lot of crop out if you get off the row there is no forgiveness with that thing when those disc killers especially when they're set tight like that middle picture if you get off a little bit it's dead there is no it will pull anything in and once it pulls it in it's dead and then also as the crop gets bigger just because of the converse disc area you're pruning less roots versus if you just had a regular sweep coming in in order to get into this area between which i said is the hardest area to get if you had that single shank and a regular sweep running here you're going to be cutting weeds and cutting cutting roots excuse me so i really really like the buffalo cultivator if i was starting it out beginning that's the first second thing i'd buy i'd buy a mirror and a buffalo cultivator and they're fairly cheap um, the two we have, well, we have four, well, we have way too many cultivators, but the, the most recent two buffaloes we've bought, we paid $600 for one and $1,000 for the other one. And then, you know, a couple hundred dollars of sweeps, and like I said, you can basically do anything with them. They're not real user-friendly to adjust, but that's just part of it. The newer ones are a little easier to adjust, but um, that goes with part of it. Uh, we're on 36 inch rows and the first time we run through we'll run a 24 inch sweep 
second time typically an 18 or a 16. If you're in a 30 inch row, I don't know. The question was, what size of sweeps do we run? Um, Doug, you're in 30s, what? Um, I run 15 and Okay, so in 30 inch rows, you're maybe running a 17, 18 inch sweep. Uh, middle picture, what I was, tr is a perfect example, I guess, of what I was trying to draw with my picture here, where if you can see that foxtail's in right tight next to the row, and up here that foxtail's leaning out, it's trying to reach for sunlight and get out of the canopy. That disc killer is tucked in tight to the row, and it is pulling, grabbing that foxtail, tossing it to the middle where the big sweep can cut it out, and that's the same exact spot. I should have got a picture in front of it, but it was ugly and behind it looks pretty darn good. The other type of cultivator we use suck quite a bit is an old Noble Vibrashank. Um, several different companies made real similar cultivators to this. Um, typically five shanks. Um, they kind of vibrate, scratch through the soil loosely. Um, don't, are not very good for big, you know, weeds, tall weeds but they are good for loose soil conditions, small plants. They do have limited soil residue clearance. Like I said, you've got five sweeps packed into a pretty tight area. Um, it can be kind of hard to move enough soil into the row because the shanks are real narrow and you typically a four to five inch sweep or at the widest, or just a lot of people just run a straight point on them. Another picture using the noble cultivator there um, this corn is probably big enough now, I would probably have used the buffalo. This year I'd use the noble just because it was dry, loose soil. Um, you can drive a little faster with these. They typically, you don't have the slabbing issue. Um, they have their place, but um, I guess, I, I've, like I said, if it, it works when it works. It doesn't when it doesn't. You're a lot more limited on what you can do with one of these versus a buffalo or other style. Um, this is second cultivation, I guess. We typically try to cultivate at least two times, if not three. Last pass, we try to wait as long to basically as tall as we can get the tractor through without breaking it over. Um, this was the 4th of July this year. Um, again, running a buffalo. At this point, we ta basically take those um, disc killers, slide them in, get them away because you don't want to cut roots. At second cultivation, we'll slide the disc killer. Question was, was what we do with the disc killers, I guess. At second cultivation, where first cultivation, I said we're running them seven to nine inches apart from in the front where they meet each other. At this cultivation, they're probably a foot to eight, probably closer to 18 inches, probably, probably 18 inches apart because you, you want to stay out of that root zone. This is second cultivation on beans. Again, running the buffalo. See the disc killer is in tight to the row. And lots of other options, I guess. This is just our system. Um, there's some real neat things being done with GPS, um, with RTK, parallel tracking things. Um, there's some camera guidance on cultivators now, flamers, tine weeders. The new one I've seen a couple different places is electric bugs, or I call them electric bug zappers, but electric weed zappers, where you're running a big generator um, just above the crop canopy, shocking the weeds that are taller. And then there's some mechanical weed pullers out there as well. So at that point, I guess I'll turn it over to Scott and we can answer some questions later on. Okay, Eric stood on that side of the room, so now you can turn your neck to this side and stare at me instead, I guess, or you can still look over there if you want, it's fine. Um, but I'm going to kind of go through some things, you're going to see some similarities in what Eric was talking about and some differences, and there's a reason for that. Um, I'm very green in organic farming, so uh, 15 was my first kind of transitional year, so I've only got a couple, three years under my belt. Uh, and dad didn't let me run the cultivator when I was younger, so I um, am kind of a novice at this. But I'm going to take you through some of the things that we do on our farm, but again, kind of notice some of the differences or some of the similarities. Every talk I go to with these, it's not a cookie cutter system. One way doesn't work for everyone. It might work great in Audubon, Iowa, in Ida Grove, or in Central Iowa, or whatever. It might not work real well. So kind of look for differences and similarities at the same time. Um, I'm also kind of a numbers guy, so I got a couple numbers here I want to throw out just to kind of get you thinking, but otherwise kind of similar. 
And then at the end, we'll leave a good 15, 20 minutes that you guys can ask us questions and um, we'll go from there. So this is kind of our setup. First thing I want to make clear, if you want to be an organic farmer, you need to buy a John Deere 4440 tractor because that's what me and Eric use, so it must be the greatest real crop tractor out there. Um, so just oddly enough, when I was working with Eric, getting into it too, he kept saying all this stuff, and I'm like, oh, we got the same tractor. We'll just kind of mimic that. So you will see some similarities here with this, but um, but that's, that's a good tractor to, to get started with anyway. So I talked about one size doesn't fit all. Uh, here's us. That's kind of works in beautiful Ida County here, um, right on the edge where we would have had some really nice thick lusts that came from the Missouri River, but we don't. Um, and then Eric, I don't know, Audubon, what are we down? Why is this? Right there? So you can see right there a lot of different soil type already from where he's at to where I'm at, and we're only about 80, 90 miles apart, whatever it is. So, so again, I'm kind of a soils guy, but just kind of be thinking about that. Uh, different soil consistencies and things are going to really change your, your cultivation techniques, too. So, real quick, like I said, I haven't been at this very long. Um, Dad was generous enough to let me try this crazy thing called organic farming on some of his ground. Um, so, again, he farms conventionally with the you know standard system, but we started transitioning a few acres to organic to see how it went. Um, so we started real small with just a 50 Got another 50 coming in. That eight, someone says, some people might say, why would you transition eight acres? Um, we need eight acres of alfalfa, so we need the hay. It works nice in the transition, which you'll see. So that one little field is kind of all by itself. But this is our tentative plans. As you'll find out, plans change pretty quickly. So this may look different next year. This is our hope, um, but we'll see how it goes on that. Our rotation, again, I'm talking about the rotation stuff because it's pretty big into weed control too. And one of the points I'm going to focus on, um, our transitional rotation, we like to come in with, uh, well, soybeans would kind of be T1 um, on this side, and then an oats alfalfa, and then building up for that first year organic, uh, which was corn. But we always wanted that solid seeded crop in the transitional rotation before the corn to help with weed pressure. Um, so ideally what I'm hoping on some of the ground is corn, soybeans, corn, and then oats, red clover. I don't know yet if that's going to work. But a more standard rotation that we see organically, corn, soybeans, oat, red clover, oat, alfalfa, whatever it might be. Um, some people are in a three- or four-year rotation. I think you guys are in how many years now, Eric? Nine? <laughs> so, again, it depends on your markets, what equipment you have, what you set up. We've liked this so far, so we're going to try to continue with it. So this is one of the things that I kind of wanted to look at um, as we look at organic versus conventional a little bit. Well, what does it cost? You know, everybody says, oh man, you know, you're making four, five, six trips across the field. That really adds up. Well, I, I tried to mimic dad's, this is just what we do, our dad does on his side for chemical um, for his kind of weed control. So I tried to mimic that to, to how it would maybe look organically if you were comparing it. So in a conventional system, we have a field cultivator with a sprayer attached, or, or with a spray, we have saddle tanks on the tractor, and we, so we spray a pre-emerge chemical down and do a field cultivation in the spring. And then just like Eric said, not much more work to do in that conventional ground. I hit it again with the sprayer and wait until you harvest it. But so we spray it one more time with the post-emerge chemical. So our weed control, and again, it's different depending on your rotation, but our weed control cost on a corn crop where the previous crop was soybeans, which is kind of the easiest one for the most part, is about 60 bucks an acre, roughly, is what we're looking at. So we compare that to organic. Um, again, it's pretty easy if soybean is the residue that you're getting rid of, and I'll look at a different one too, but we feel cultivate it twice, Probably rotary hoe it twice, real cultivate it twice. That's that's most of our weed control if it was soybeans. So we're looking at 26 bucks. Now, again, you do have to get some of this equipment, but like Eric said, a lot of it uh, is fairly cheap, but you do have to really put some money and time in to get it working right. So any questions on that breakdown on that? Yeah. 
So the equipment cost here, this five dollar and fifty cents, is the variable cost and the fixed cost associated with it. So it should take into that. This is from Ag Decision Maker, somewhat Craig Chase, and that does so. Yeah. I'm sorry. It it does it take into effect the fixed costs and the variable costs of of running that piece of equipment across the ground. It tries to. So yeah, uh, the next question is, does it take into account the labor and the time? That's factored into that number too, for the most part, so that when you're sitting down to do a budget, you kind of know what well, cost me this much as far as the price for the fuel, for the labor, for the equipment to do that one trip across the field. So, so like I said, just kind of play with this as we look at budgets. Um, Dad was a little surprised. We'd never really broke down the chemical side budget because you just you got to do it. There's not really any choice. You could put more or less chemicals down, but it was kind of interesting to see the difference. We didn't know it was that big. Yeah, so the question was, where do these numbers come from? Iowa State University Ag Decision Maker is a great tool. It's got the spreadsheets. All the numbers are filled in. All you do is plug in your information, and it'll kind of tell you this is what you can expect to see with today's prices, uh, and it has an organic Ag decision maker in there too, which is really nice. So, good question. So again, the same thing. The only difference is w when you have the previous crop of corn or even a solid seeded crop, you got a little more residue to deal with, so you're you're tearing it up a little more. Um, so again, pretty similar in the costs, but uh, we do fall tillage in our area, so you have an extra fall tillage pass um, is about the only difference really on most of that. So again, you know, we talk about weed control uh, and we talk a little bit about rotation um, and Eric will probably agree, this is probably one of our biggest weed control tools on the farm right now. We do have livestock in the farm, but having a system, this was in the transitional years where it was hay for a couple years and you're continually cutting that, cutting those crops, cutting those weeds, keeping the weeds down is huge. So. We'll talk about that a little, but this is a, a pretty good tool that we use to, to handle weeds um, that maybe you don't think about in a conventional row crop system. Another good tool for weeds. Um, this is what we were doing after we took off the oats. But again, you want to have the ability to just cut and cut and cut, especially if you're dealing with a thistle problem or something like that. You have very few options besides uh, a lot of cuttings on that. So, so again, um, it's all about that rotation. If you remember, my, my kind of projected uh, rotation was corn, soybeans, corn, and then go back into a solid crop. I don't know yet if we're going to be able to do that or not. If, if we got pretty good weed pressure this year in our soybeans, I'm probably not going to go back and try to plant corn that next year in there. I'm going to rotate that out, get it into a solid seeded crop. It really just depends on what kind of weed pressure we're looking at. But rotational weed control is definitely a, a big deal um, and something that I really think organic far helps organic farmers um, you know to keep the weeds down on that so so the rest of this here I'll, I'll go through pretty quickly because we want to hear from you guys we want to hear what questions you have what you might think but I'm gonna kind of follow the same template going to start with fall tillage here and kind of look at this is what we do for fall tillage and then follow the growing season as far as from pre-emerge to post-emerge cultivation and things like this. This is just a standard chisel plow, nothing real special about that. Um, we like to knock down the corn stalks in the fall and or the alfalfa or the red clover that we have there. We like to get that breaking down a little bit in the late fall. Some guys really don't like to do fall tillage in the fall, and that's fine. We like to start getting that to break down a little. Our biggest concern is if we got a wet spring, how many times are we going to be able to get out there and get a pass across that to get it terminated, especially on a solid seeded crop? So in the fall, we, we try to chisel the stalks or at least get them disc down once on that. Again, nothing special there, um, except for the fact that uh, the the springs on there um, are a huge deal in our area. We found rocks that we didn't realize we had, and we had an old-fashioned chisel plow without that, um, and uh, it'll bend that entire kind of gang or that, uh, that bar there pretty quickly. So um, 
there, there is a reason there's some price differences in those, and we figured that out pretty quickly on that. Uh, but this is what Eric was talking about. Um, this is the one we bent really bad here. There's no springs on there. It was not fun. But the idea here is on a solid seeded crop, an alfalfa specifically is where we use this, um, is you still got the chisel plow point, but then you got what's called a heel sweep. So you can get just under that alfalfa, under the roots, and, and break those crowns up and, and terminate it. So we do this in the fall just on alfalfa ground. If it's red clover ground, we just rip it with straight chisel tip on there. But this is just for that. So any question on that pass? I know Eric talked about it too, but okay. Not very deep. I, I mean, you got the chisel point that's going in the ground, but we're just doing everything we can just to get that heel sweep started in the ground. But it doesn't get very deep at all. I don't know. Eric, how far? The, the clover is a little different where we, um, because it doesn't have the same root system that alfalfa, it's not really a big deal to break those roots up as bad. So we can get by with just aerating the soil a little with straight tips and then knocking it with the field cultivator in the spring. Sorry, I forgot to repeat that question, but... I don't even, we'll catch it on the next one, I guarantee it. <laughs> so um, next, I, I told Eric, when I saw his picture of a John Deere 550 mulch master, I said, don't you dare show that to people. I've been looking for one for two years. Now, anybody new in this room that's thinking about organic is going to be looking for a John Deere 550, but it is what it is. It's a nice tool. Um, we have a neighbor that has one. We're going to try to borrow it from him and use it too. I really like it. Um, I will, I guess, mention before we get too far, all this equipment that I'm showing you is not mine. This is Dad's, and I have the privilege to use it. So um, this was his kind of new toy a couple years ago. This is a Case IH Tiger Mate field cultivator. Um, nothing real special, except we do really like the rolling basket on the back. It doesn't do as good a job as whatever you call those things on the on the, the bush or the, yep. It doesn't do quite a good a job. The, the root balls in the alfalfa, it doesn't quite knock them down as good. But, um, but we like this system, and, and we'll hit it with this a couple times and feel pretty good with it. So, again, here's just a little bit of uh, alfalfa that we had coming back still. We're hitting that with that field cultivator. It's really turning it black. That's what we're hoping for on that. And, again, that, that's the goal. Um, this is one of the flattest pieces of ground in Western Ida County, I can guarantee you. And that's why we started with this field, because we didn't want to deal with that contour stuff that uh, Eric was telling you about. But again, we want it black. We want it tilled right before we plant so that we can stay ahead of those weeds, too, uh, and try our best on that. So uh, a rotary hoe. Eric already talked about it a little bit. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We're on 30 inch spacing. so. 12 row planter, 30 foot rotary hoe, trying to stay on those same lines when we're going through the field. We bought this from a neighbor that had been sitting out in the grove for 10 years. So guess what we got to do? Just what Eric said, replace bearings and bearings. It is the most frustrating thing about hoeing. It looks so simple until one of those bearings goes out and it either leans sideways and ties up the other hoe teeth that are trying to move or just flings off, or just stops moving completely, and now you're digging a trench across your field. Um, I don't know, I probably replaced 20 of those at least um, that first year, but uh, go through it in the winter, wherever that comment was made. If they don't spin freely, if there's even a little bit of, of friction, they're probably junk already, and replace that bearing or, or buy a whole new wheel on that. This little toy right here is not mine at all by any means but it's kind of on my Christmas wish list uh, this is a tine weeder um, we have some guys in our areas that use them and have good success at the same time you know we've had some issues with it too um, this is a farm that I work with in southern Minnesota but um, I don't know I, I kind of like to try it just kind of a close up there again you're, you're pulling those tines across the field it's great in low residue situations um, our concern right now is Typically, let's say on a bean year, how much can we get those corn stalks kind of broke up so that we're not using this as a rake instead of a tine weeder? But 
I think it has a lot of good aspects, and we want to try to look at it a little more. And we can talk about it here later, too. If any of you have experiences with it, feel free to let us know on that. Um, so for, for cultivation, this is just kind of what we had available or what Dad had still in the barn. So that's what we chose to use. Uh, international, what was it, 183, I think, six-row cultivator. Nothing real special about it. Um, but it does take some fine tuning. For a novice like me that never cultivated before, I thought you could just hook it up and go. Um, I had a lot to learn about that. So um, so like I said, we, we, we use this regular what, C shank um, cultivator as our first pass cultivator. Um, we just we liked how we could get the shields on there. We could get pretty tight. The, the biggest issues we got is we got some sway um, here with a, with a quick hitch, I guess, hooks up to it. And so when you are on side hills, it kind of sways down a little bit, and, and we haven't got that completely taken care of. So we did wipe out some crops with it. But uh, like I said, we, we like this for the early pass. Um, we might change and do something new, but it works for us right now. Oh, that's a flamer. Uh, again, Eric kind of mentioned them too. We haven't used one yet. This isn't ours either. I don't know. It's something on the wish list. It's probably down the line a ways for us. Um, I think I'd look at the tine weeder first if we were to get a new tillage equipment right now. But um, it's something to kind of play with. The neat thing with the flamer, this is what I like about them. So there's your corn burnt um, pretty decently. Um, and here's, here's the green crop that you're easily going to take out with your tillage or with your cultivator so it's getting all those weeds right in there like Eric was talking about with the cutaway discs you're doing the same thing with the flamer um, so I like it I, I, I see some really good results with it um, if you have woolly fence lines and things bring a bring a fire extinguisher with you I see a lot of fence lines get started on fire with these but if you do it right I, I think it's a good tool and something we'll probably look at or maybe we can talk about too so for us again uh, this is kind of our earliest cultivation that we were running through there um, a farmer next to me I asked him I'm like man I feel like I'm cultivating and it looks really clean maybe I should just stop cultivating and leave and the best advice I ever got is if in doubt do it anyway don't worry about if you're gonna lose some moisture cultivate it just like Eric said with the hoe you can't see the weeds they're coming so don't let it get in front of you on that right there uh, there's the edge where um, there's some weeds definitely coming we probably should have run the hoe over that one more time would have been great but you know it uh, kind of is what it is so so they're coming stay in front of them the best you can on that um, here's my guidance system again farmer had it in his garage for 10 years I thought oh, I'll just hook it up to the tractor and pull the cultivator with it this is simple Never got it to function this year at all. Couldn't get it to move. It didn't do a darn thing. Um, so I'm going to take it over to Nebraska and have them work it up and hopefully be able to use it. Um, we didn't feel as much of a need for it. We don't have the hills that they do south of us. The areas that we're doing are fairly flat, but I think it's a good tool still. Again, we do use the Buffalo 4640 um, for our second pass, kind of, in corn and soybeans. Um, you know, we, we like how it uh, moves a lot of dirt. We want to throw dirt into the row as much as we can at that point. So we're trying our best to, to move some dirt with it. So, so like I said, you know, buffalo is a pretty common trend here on that. It does do a good job or other um, similar type cultivators. So I guess I'll kind of end on this. Um, you can do everything right. You can have a beautiful growing season. Uh, this was our crop this year. You can see a couple different varieties there, but, you know, it was beautiful. You know, I was calling the bank, telling them, make room. We got money coming like you wouldn't believe. We got an awesome organic crop here. And this was a week later on our farm. Um, we had 60-mile-an-hour winds. Um, you know, things happen, I guess. As bad as that looks, and even Dad was kind of amazed. He hadn't seen something quite that bad Um and I'm a seed rep, too, so of course he said, well, you planted the wrong seed. It's probably your issue. Uh, and maybe I did. I don't know. But as bad as that looks, those trenches with that buffalo cultivator fit a snoot really nice for picking up corn. And you could get the snoot under there. And we probably picked up 95% of that corn. And that was only a small portion of the farm. But, again, Mother Nature is going to 
throw your curveball, and, and that's what it is. So, like I said, we're, we want to leave plenty of time here. we got 20 minutes or so for questions. So, again, thank you. There's my contact information if you want to get a hold of me, and we're happy to move on to questions. Okay, so I'll start since he was closer to me, Eric. And if it come from your side, you start. How about that? So the question was, what kind of yields did we see and where did we market our crops? Um, again, this was our first corn crop, organic, and um, we had a rotation built up where we were really trying to push that first crop. So I think field average there was 210, 215 on that, but things lined up really well. Um, we work with a couple different buyers. We're right now Pipeline Foods in Atlantic just because it was close and they would take wet corn. When the corn blows over, it doesn't dry. We found out. I found out. Dad already knew this, but I didn't. Um, so that was my experience. Uh, Mike. Uh, his question was conven yields and then yield, organic yield versus conventional yield. We got hit with the kind of the similar windstorm that Scott did. I didn't have as much luck picking it up as probably Scott did. I'd say we probably left a third of it out there. We bought a corn reel and we bought other things and went one way and took half the width of the corn head and just it was a nightmare. But our farm average was probably in the 150 to 160 range. Um, this year our plot range was 230 to 130. Um, judging on maturity, and I didn't speak about maturity, and Scott didn't either, but um, real quick, I guess if you're going to be organic, have a dryer. Have some way to dry corn and plant full season crops. Um, it, it'll more than pay. This year, the 98-day corn was 130, 113-day corn was 230. So that's 100 bushel an acre difference. 100 bushel times $9 roughly, $900 an acre in maturity and that'll pay for a bin burner pretty darn fast. Um, so back to your question, yield versus conventional, I would guess our county yield this year will be right around 200. So but typically I would say 70 to 80% of conventional is, is our goal. Sometimes it's better, sometimes worse, but average in that 75% range, I guess, is kind of where we typically are. And how are you selling your range? Um, we sell also to Pipeline. We're only about 20 miles from Atlantic, so Pipeline. FW Cobbs and Council Bluffs has bought a lot of our corn in the past, and Schooler as well has bought a lot. Um, they generally will pick it up on the farm. And if you, you know, all these buyers here, there's lots of demand for organic. Um, we're getting calls basically probably once a week of buyers looking for organic grain. They, it is in high demand, and if you kind of, if you build it, they will come. If you grow it, they will come. I'm going to defer to Eric because I haven't figured it out at all yet. So I called him probably half a dozen times this year on the same issue. Sway blocks and stabilizer discs for your cultivator is the question. Um, I don't know if my dad's in this. He's not. I don't see him. But we have this argument every year. Um, I like things tight. I want it to move when I move. Dad likes things loose. He say, On the 4440, which we both run, you can turn them up so that it is solid when you raise it and it's very loose when it's down or you can leave them down which is tight when it's down kind of looser when you're up um, I guess it's a personal preference I'm not gonna say one way is better than the other way um, in our contours dad feels it's hard on the, harder on the cultivator when it's tight because as you're going around that curve you're twisting and I, I would agree with that. I mean, it does make some more popping and creaking and moaning if you've got a tight curve. If that thing's really set tight, you're putting some side draft on parallel linkages and things that can get harder. Um, stabilizer discs you mentioned. I don't know what Scott has on his 183, but that's a common issue with that C-shank or Vibershank style. Um, the C-shank and the Vibershanks we run, we have some, I think they're 24-inch we run two of them stabilizer discs on a great big spring, and we try to put as much down pressure on them as we can. Um, that's probably another advantage of the Buffalo is you have, like for a six row, you will have seven stabilizer discs. So you just have more pull wanting to go straight forward, I guess. 
And I'll just add real quickly too, the only other thing we saw is with the guidance systems, which I was looking into a lot. If you have a pivoting type, like a buffalo, I think you want them pretty tight on that, don't you? Or you want them loose. Yep. But then if you have a slide guidance system where it kind of it slides back and forth on you, I think you want them the opposite. And so you want to look at that if you're looking into guidance systems too. Right. Yeah, on that, on that pivoting one, you have to have it loose so that when it turns, it has some give to steer it, to move it. But I'd say if you're straight, I guess I would set them tight to begin with, just so it, when you can move, it will move with you. Um, like I said, it's kind of personal preference, I guess. Is I don't have a, there's no one solution to all, but I don't know if any of these other organic, I guess anybody else has any comments to that that's been doing it? How, how do you run yours or how do you? So you like it tight. Yeah. Can okay. you repeat what that um, Scott said that on an international tractor, which a lot of our customers are using, like I think like 1066s and 86s and things, they didn't have sway blocks like a John Deere. But he said there's a company in Minnesota somewhere. Anyway, there's a company that will make some stabilizer attachments for those international older international tractors to lock it tight because they didn't come from the factory with any way to make them tight uh question was regarding wet spots if cultivation's the best tool or what the number one strategy is, I guess. Um, that's hard. Every year is different, but early weed control is probably crucial. Your rotary hoeing or harrowing, and neither Scott or I talked about harrowing, I guess, after planting. Um, we've kind of went away from it, but a lot of people will harrow or tine weed on, say, day three to five. Um, you want to stay ahead of the weeds. Uh, if you can get the weeds in that white root to early growth stage, they're way easier to take out than if they get a foot tall. And as far as the wet spots, we're in side hills. Ponding is not an issue at all. Um, we're on slopes. We do have a lot of CP wet spots. That's where you, um, they're a challenge. Um, if they're real bad every year, we'll just leave that half an acre, quarter an acre, whatever in hay, or we put some into prairie strips and other things, I guess. Um, we've tried to leave the worst of the areas out of production, I guess you could say, or a, a different solid seeded production area. Okay. Okay. Comment on the sway blocks again. It's Klinger Manufacturing, um, and the the phone number was on this PowerPoint on my PowerPoint. If there, I think that'll be available afterwards. Um, question was if we've tried the roller crimping cereal rye and we tried it one time and it was a failure. Um, I've had a lot of customers try it with varying successes and I don't want to make Sarah mad, but in a perfect situation with perfect conditions, it works great. If things don't go as planned, you can have big issues. And it, I, I think it's a great idea and I think they're getting better at different systems, but um, I, I'd hate to see some a new beginner go out and do 200 acres of it the first year. Um, and I don't know, other people I'm sure have tried it. We tried it one year. The issue we had, it worked great. It never rained for about six weeks from June to July. We planted the soybeans. They got up about three inches tall and ran out of moisture and just died. That, that rye had sucked all the water basically out of the top foot of soil and with no rain, we planted them three, three and a half inches deep, as deep as we could, our planter would plant them. Got them coming, they got about three inches tall and just welded up and shriveled up and died. Yeah, I just add, I think 
the roller crimping is great, but since this class is beginner's weed control too, um, I think we'll try it eventually too, but um, I don't know that I'd want to. You got enough hurdles already trying to farm organically, and it is a good system when it works, but it's another variable that you have to deal with that you might not want in your very beginning years. So the question was, what's the difference between like a John Deere 4640 and a 4440, you said? Or you mean the buffalo? Okay, so what's the difference in the different models of buffaloes? And then uh, do we use other cover, cover crops in the system? I guess on the buffalo, the big difference, uh, if you've seen on Eric's, uh, he's got an earlier model that it had those kind of cutaway disc things on the, on the wheels in the front. And mine has the solid rubber wheels on the front. That's... For the most part, the one of the biggest differences um, that I can think of, I think both work fine, but I don't know. Eric, your thought on that? Yeah, that's the main difference. The 4640 has a rubber tire, and then the stabilizer or cutting disc is its own separate attachment in the middle of the, the gang or the unit. The 4600s have the stabilizer disc and the depth wheel or gauge wheel in the same spot, basically. And then well, but to finish that on the cover crop, then your second question on that, you know, in, I don't know, in a tight three-year rotation organically, you know, we have that oat year in there. And so then we're solid seeding a red clover or maybe an alfalfa. So we have that. The other two years, we, you know, we do a lot of tillage uh, or we're going to in our organics. So um, if we did anything, it'd be looking at, uh, at, at maybe some rye. But right now, just on once every three years, I guess, is, is how we do it. So red clover and a red clover non-winter hardy alfalfa is our kind of go-to we've done some pfi dad's done some pfi research on red clover and doug's done it as well um, red clover versus a summer seeded where you went in after the oats or small grain teared it up planted dry radish peas a bunch of different things and it was pretty consistent that the red clover beat it most years um, the hardest challenge was the getting that late summer seeded cover crop established, um, which the, the last few years had probably worked great because we've been stupid wet in the fall. But the years that we tried it, it was typically hot, dry August. And true. Yep. Yep. Getting the the midsummer establishment is the key. So to answer your question, Wendy, red clover and alfalfa is the two basic ones. The question was regarding back to this cultivator topic with the newer ones with the gauge wheel tire and then the colder in the middle. Uh, crowd comment that he actually had more luck with the older style that put the colder up front because it gives you more trash clearance in between the gauge wheel per se and the disc, the cutaway disc and the sweep. And Scott and I had that same exact conversation sitting here before the session started. And we, we, I would agree with you 100%. We ridge till our soybeans um, a lot of years, and we saw the same exact thing with that center cut, cutaway disc in the middle there. It just, everything was too tight and compact. So we went back to the old 4600 style as well. Yeah, the, the one disadvantage, at least our Buffalo sales rep told believe sales reps but um is with that disc there if you have heavy clay soils and things you end up binding it up and plugging it up a lot so for our soil types it probably works fine for other soil types um you know they, they might really um not like it i guess Um, no, it was just kind of, uh, dad, uh, grinds some ear corn for cattle that he feeds out. And so at the end of the year, we happen to have both of them out, which hardly ever happens. Um, and, uh, so just kind of a, a fun picture, but organically, no, nothing on ear corn. Um, but conventionally, uh, we do just enough. Um, problem is we usually cuss it for three days and we're using it and then we don't want to see it for another year. So. Uh, 
Uh, qu yep. Question was, when we sell corn picked up on the farm, if they charge us for the freight or what kind of, if they take it out of your premium, typically they will bid you either a delivered price or a picked up on the farm price. We've done it both ways. Um, I guess it varies. Sometimes I don't like the picked up on the farm because you don't know the trucker. Um, we've recently they've been getting better ones, I guess I would say, but we've had some some issues, I guess, with not showing up on time, not having clean trailers. Sometimes you wonder if the guy even knows where he's going. Um, but I guess to answer, they'll t they'll they'll take it out of your price basically. On the other hand, we do have when we sell like oats, for example, to Gray Millers, their food grade they have a very strict process on putting seals on trailers and cleaning trailers. We typically sell them picked up on the farm. They have their own drivers that know their system and it's just simpler for them having a trucker that knows exactly what they want for their criteria versus trying to explain it to one of your own truckers. So we do both ways, I guess. And Yeah, I'll just comment to that too. I, I guess, you know, like you said, most buyers do it both, but, you know, I talked about, oh, I sold my grain because it was closest to me. You know, I wouldn't get too caught up in that. You can truck grain a long way, especially corn, um, to find markets for it. So whether you're trucking it yourself or not, uh, we'd like to do it ourselves just because our equipment's smaller and tends to break down a lot. And maybe you guys aren't like that, but we don't want trucks sitting there waiting as we're trying to set a sweep auger or do something like that. But, you know, it ain't nothing to get your corn, you know, down the road a long way and still have good margin in there, uh, even though it doesn't seem like it's the closest buyer to you. Yeah, it's over here and right there. Is that a Cub shirt? Oh, perfect. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So, so the question is, how many row cultivator passes do you do? Um, you know, like I said, we're pretty new at it, so we're, we're hoping to get by with two. I think sometimes it's as many as Mother Nature would let you do. Um, it doesn't hurt to be out there cultivating usually, but we've been able to get by with two. I think for beans, we might have to look at three ourselves. I'll, exactly. Our goal ideally is two on corn, three on soybeans. This year it was one because it rained and rained and rained. But the plus side of the rain was the corn grew fast and it grew fast enough. And by planting late, um, it, it outgrew the weeds basically. And we had fairly clean fields for only getting through them once, but weather is key there. But ideally two times on corn, three times on beans. Correct. Yep. Or when you get a little bit more advanced, you have way too many cultivators and you just have one set for a certain stage so you can back up to one, grab it. Yep. Yep. And as cheap, we're always looking. I'm always watching <laughs> Craigslist, Big Iron, Auction Time, especially for Buffalo cultivators because they're so cheap and like you said, it, it's it's a pain to adjust them. I'd, I'd recommend getting a cordless impact because they will make your life so much easier. <laughs> I, I was just going to mention that same thing. Um, if you've ever tried to adjust a buffalo, after you spend a day or two out there trying to break those bolts loose, you finally realize maybe I'll just spend a $1,000 and buy another cultivator. Uh, and I think that <laughs> isn't a bad idea. So, yeah, in the back there. Okay, so the question was identity preserved, and, and especially like in a split operation, do you run the, the same one? Um, yes, definitely, um, but there, there, you got to be pretty rigorous on cleaning it out. So what we do, we have a just a gas leaf blower. We get up in the tank, blow it all down the best we can, and then purge it. Uh, you know, we do have to purge it and record that purging um, before we go into the organic field. So that's our kind of system. So how much is the purge? There's no set. I, I guess it's when you feel like, you know, you got some through there. We do a lot of non-GM crops, even on the conventional side, so we don't worry about GMO contamination. But I don't know, I guess, Eric, what 10, you think. 20 bushel. We do the same thing. Gas-powered leaf blower. Open up your shields, blow the top of your rotor off. Flush it, blow it off again. Then document. The main thing is documentation. Save that scale ticket if you haul that 20 bushel to co-op or wherever. Save that scale ticket. 
write down the date that you blew it, blow it off. It's usually not. Does that documentation then go with when it's delivered? Uh, no, that would go with your certifier. When your inspector comes, he'll typically want um, a cleaning record or a, you know, a log of when you did that. So, same with cleaning grain bins. You know, sleep your grain bin out good. Anymore, it's so easy with everybody has cam basically everybody has cameras or phones. I'll snap pictures. I sweep the bin out. I snap a picture, if nothing else, because then in February when I'm doing my you know ahead of time organic paperwork like always, I can look back and there's a neat little date on when you took that picture. So if you didn't get it wrote down, which I sometimes get behind doing, you can look at the date on that picture and say, yeah, I cleaned the bin on. October 15th, or I cultivated on June 4th. Um, it's, it's a very easy way to, to log things. Um, and then you, if your inspector ever has a question, you can show them that picture and kind of answers any questions, so. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so the question is in your wheel tracks with the cultivator, um, how do you get get that down uh, in them compaction zones? Um, <laughs> I've seen a lot of unique ways that people do it, but I don't know. The, we haven't had a lot of issue, but just getting more weight on those or adjusting those a little deeper seemed to be the best or what worked for us was just a little light adjustment. Those buffaloes are nice because you can adjust each sweep independently. Um, pretty good or adjust the pitch but um, but I've seen a lot of people add weight on those two sections too to get it in the ground is my experience I've seen the same thing I've seen everything from guys strapping a cement block with a ratchet strap on top of that row unit gang um, ideally on like even like the 183s the spring types you can tighten that spring a little bit and pitch that shank down a little more to make it suck in or dig but if it's like any other sea shank that I've ever been around, those bolts are rusted, and if you try to tighten them, they break off or you round them off. But uh, what I have found, the first thing I would do is you've got the two bolts that hold your sweep. On the top one, between the shank and the sweep, use flat washers mm -hmm. as your pitch control. Mm -hmm. Get that thing pointed down a little bit more so it sucks the rest of them in. Yep. It doesn't help all the time, but it's a starting point. Yeah, so if you didn't hear that, you know, just changing the pitch by putting some spacers there in the top of that sweep to get it a little more aggressive. So, so yeah. Oh, okay. Catch us if you got questions. Me and Eric will be around.